August, June 14th. Um, we the North. So <laughs> we the North champs, the champions of the North. Um, what a great slogan that is. Yeah. You know, to draw people together and to make people feel like they're part of something. And as many of you know, Canada has one basketball team. Um, I lived in Vancouver for a while where the other basketball team was yeah. for a short period of time. Uh, and I have to say, like, there wasn't a lot of sadness or tears when, when that franchise moved. So, you know, <laughs> it's, not, um, it's not a game that everybody is passionate about all the time, but I think that there's something about uh, these kind of runs that bring people together and even being out on the streets in Kingston, we're like, oh yeah, like this is exciting. This is community uh, expressed in a different way. Anyhow, that's my, that's my morning uh, reflection. <laughs> we can all get on a bus now. Um, so today we are in day two of FOLDA, the Festival of Live Digital Art. Uh, my name is Adrian Wong. I am the artistic producer of Spider Web Show, which is the producing entity of the festival. And I'm one of the co-curators of the festival, along with Michael Wheeler and Sarah Garten Stanley. And we are here this morning to have what we've uh, termed in the schedule an informal breakfast chat about VR. Um, and with us, I'm going to get you to introduce yourself and say your name, because I'm actually afraid that I might mess it up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. It's great to be here with you. Uh, I'm Wojtek Markowski. And, uh, I've been uh, producing film and animation for the last 15 years and um, in 2015 I started um, developing um, my company um, focused on VR and 360 video production. Um, then in 2017 I started um, producing and working in VR in the context of theater and art. Uh, in a collective, artistic collective called Dream Adoption Society. Um, and we would like to talk about uh, VR and uh, uh, the different aspects of it. So feel free, please, to um, ask questions and, and interrupt me. Uh, it would be great. Um, so I would like to start maybe um, uh, uh, connected with the slogan, uh, the North. Um, you remember this uh, first documentary film in the history of uh, cinematography, Nanook of the North, uh, mm -hmm. by Robert yeah. Flaherty. Mm -hmm. As, and uh, it occurred after years uh, that uh, from the letters of the director that actually the whole film was staged. Uh, and uh, that was quite an interesting um, case um, because everybody associated this film as true documentary and really the first one. Uh, it is the first one, uh, probably, mm, but for me it, it doesn't really matter whether it was mm, really very staged or, um, or it was just shot um, let's say, without um, the influence of the director. Um, because what we want to really achieve, whether it's documentary, fiction, VR, theater, I think it's magic. Some kind of, some kind of magic, some kind of, um, um, yeah, what exactly? Uh, so this is, I think, an interesting question, what we would like um, to achieve uh, creating our um, pieces of art. Um, I think it's the variety is so big and uh, there are so many um, options uh, that it depends on each artist. Uh, but um, can, but I, yeah. can I interrupt you mm -hmm. here because I think um, I'm curious about what this idea of magic, like creating magic, what does that mean to you and Dream Adoption Society as you're making your pieces? Like what kind of magic or experience are you trying to give to your audience members? Um, of course it depends on, the, uh, on each um, piece, but uh, 
generally you can say that uh, we are really into a kind of meditation in VR. Okay. So um, everyone is thinking about storytelling. Everyone uh, thinks how to tell a story in VR. We don't have editing so much. We don't have the uh, frame composition. Uh, we can't uh, create meaning with a cut. Uh, it's very difficult well, how to do it. Um, so maybe after this few years of work, uh, we at our collective thought that maybe it's not about storytelling, actually. Mm. Maybe it's about the experience itself. Maybe it's about like putting somebody in the skin of, of somebody else. Maybe it's about putting a viewer inside the head of the artist. So I think it's the very interesting moment when first time in life, in history, let's say, in this new medium, you can be actually in the head of the artist. So, um, so this is really um, interesting. And uh, I, I was writing my diploma about editing. And um, what I found out about the most important uh, aspect of editing, um, what is the most important? I think emotion, like creating emotions. Mm -hmm. So for me, the story is on the second place. The first is emotion. And depending on the piece of work, uh, we want <coughs> either to achieve like a metaphysical um, high or um, some kind of um, mm, feeling in the viewer yeah. that doesn't have to be really connected with understanding the piece, yeah. with analyzing the piece, uh, but more about immersing uh, her or him. So in our works, we aim to abstract art. Mm -hmm. We are in the direction of um, uh, of um, <coughs> performance, theater, or uh, VR installations um, that are not supposed to uh, teach you something, yeah. but uh, uh, but the best would be if you just um, become speechless after a piece. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, 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 right. You know, then after a piece you can't say anything because any word would just spoil the meaning, or it would be too flat or uh, too shallow. Or yeah, yeah, it's something that takes a bit more time to digest and, and process because it's new, new, and, and leaves you in a state of, I like that idea of meditation. It strikes me. I just want to say for those who have entered our room, just entered our room, that this is an informal chat. So um, I'm going to try and keep my eyes in the room. So if you have something you want to add. Like, like, jump in there, or raise your hand, and I'll and I'll try to moderate. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, <coughs> one thing that I I wrestle with in some of these uh, with simula I haven't done actually VR performance, but lots of immersive and, and digitally enhanced and not is on the, uh, it's fantastic and create amazing effects that can and totally get you in the head of the artist, which is a great thing, but it can also be. A dangerous thing, as Breck talked about and many other people, insofar as um, you become completely subsumed within that one perspective and lose your critical distance. And that perspective, in some cases, can be, I've seen VR pieces about um, you know, abuse of immigrant, you know, immigrants and uh, terrorism, all sorts of really powerful things that you really become, um, that's really useful. But it's also, it is a simulated environment. So the fact that Nanak of the North wasn't was presenting itself as reality and wasn't if you have a simulated environment that presents itself as reality you feel like you've been there you feel like you've had first hand experience and the propagandistic potential of that is phenomenal so i'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how to navigate that challenge well um, i think um a very interesting idea of filmmaking um was uh, uh, invented, let's say, by Andy Warhol. And he uh, was just uh, leaving the camera for so many hours. Um, and then uh, there is always a moment of truth 
when somebody is just uh, forgetting that the camera is there or um, mm, it's just uh, happening. Uh, so it's, it's different when it comes to uh, interactive um, animated um, experiences and, and uh, shooting. Um, but um, I don't think I really understood your question. Uh, because uh, um, so maybe you could guide me more. Yeah. So do you mean I, I'm I'm gonna try. I'm yes. gonna try. Thank you. It's very easy for me. Um, so do you mean like inside of these VR, these immersive experiences? that it's easy to give ourselves over to that experience uh, and to, say, the meditation or to that kind of first-time experience feeling. Um, and and because, of, because it's all new information, we disconnect a little bit from that part of our brains that's uh, reading the intent of the piece or reading, have, bringing some like understanding of the context political or social context of it, or understanding it. Um, uh, it I, you use the word critical. I'm trying to right. define something without using the word, but in, a, right. in that critical way. Is that what you're talking well, about? Well, partly, but it, yeah. isn't, um, it isn't so much um, the newness of it. Yeah. And, you know, it's really, when you present, I mean, there's a problem with traditional film and production <laughs> media as well, but it becomes completely compelling, so that yeah. you completely absorb and your empathy is 100% with the piece. And it's not a problem, it's like the pieces that you were demonstrating before, where these wonderful fantasy surrealist realms, it isn't really a problem. But if you're representing yeah. Manic of the North, or anything, I mean, as soon as you get into any sort of area of uh, dealing with issues of gender, or race, or class, you know, the danger is that you're going to be giving people this first hand, what's it like to be in, you know, uh, an internment camp? And then whatever biases of the person that's creating it become your reality, and you walk out of it. And the power is, I was there, I felt it, but you weren't really, mm -hmm. and that reality was constructed for you. Um, and you, and it, this, the piece uh, really prevents you from having that sort of critical distance and perspective on, on you know, what biases, might, unconscious, maybe well intentioned, maybe not, might have informed the piece. I wonder if it's different because. I mean, people certainly experience that reading, reading books. Right. Like they read um, yeah. uh, the Call of the Wild, right? And they were like, "Oh, this is it!" And I know that I've certainly done that reading Pearl S. Buck when I was a kid, going, "Oh, this is China, right?" Um, and feeling like I have an understanding of what <laughs> <laughs> from her books. No, I don't. Um, and so we've, over time and literacy, my own literacy of, of reading, I get to. Uh, understand that that is positionality and then and so I guess what I understand your question to be is like is it di like is it harder or different in VR than in any of these other media and then there are strategies that people have come up with in theater and in writing mm -hmm. if you're concerned about doing that um, yeah. to both suck people in but also to create that, that sort of reflection and, and uh, yeah. dialogue so I'm wondering if VR has developed similar or could develop similar or if it's so, the rhetoric is so profound of immersion and the power of giving you that first person is so powerful that I think there must be ways to do it. But. Yeah. yeah, it's like just to riff on it a little bit as a thought experiment. You know, if you're in a VR environment and you learn that puppies, let's say little brown puppies, um, are actually killers and they are pursuing you and you live within that reality in a repetitive way, that your capacity, my capacity, I, I suspect over time, will, <coughs> will be diminished to be able to understand in uh, the real world, if there's such a thing, mm -hmm. that puppies are not actually that way anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that critical distance that you speak about, that feeling of it being so totally real and how we hold those, um, those experiences, not just images, but the, the emotional response, um, as a thought experiment, I think that is a real danger. But also, um, 
the, the crazy thing is propagandistic wise, mm. it, you can say, well, but it, it's an environment for absolute good, like the uh, heightening of empathy or whatever, but then back to positionality, it's like, from whose perspective? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, it's really. We should remember about the suspension of disbelief and uh, just the fact that we are uh, not aware that uh, we are in the room, we are actually there. But as far as I'm concerned, it's always like this, that the artist wants you to, um, to see his or her vision. Uh, sometimes it's gentle, uh, sometimes it's straightforward, more. but uh, here it's just stronger. Uh, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. No, and like, I, this may sound a little antagonistic, I'm sorry if it does, but like you're not giving the audience member enough intelligence. I think you have to, you have to not assume that everyone who's coming into this is dumb. You know, like, like everyone is going to voluntarily come into this. They are going to be able to, with this suspension of disbelief, like whatever their understanding is, like that, that is what their mode of thought is going to be. That's what they, their experience is going to be. You can't necessarily be concerned or be worried of, well, this is like what it, like my, my propaganda is going to be or my, my, my intent is going to be because you have to give them agency. And we can't just assume that, well, they're not artists, so they're not gonna understand. And that's, I, that, that's what I was thinking of when you were saying all of these things and like, so I, there is, for me in my experience, there, there is this way that we talk about ourselves as artists it, that kind of does come off as elitist. And we have to also like think about anybody can be an artist, anybody can experience these things. And so we can't, we can't have that separation, that divide within this context. And like, cause it, it happens in like anything in everyday life, not just artistry. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. And, and, uh even with kids, one of the things you're talking about about giving an experience rather than telling a story or teaching a lesson, um, that's one of my beefs actually with theater for young audiences. I saw some baby theater, which is truly like an immersive thing because the babies, babies are like in like, wow, this is the first time I've seen this. Uh, this is, I've never been here before. And they're just like always in this state of awe, unless they're hungry or tired, but, um, <laughs> or sleep. But um, the piece that I saw was uh, by a Danish company, and it was, it's experiential. So they're touching things. They're seeing dancers. They're invited into the space. So when you're talking about these things, I'm like, that's what the babies are doing in that show. Like, they're moving into the space. They're dancing. They're hearing the music. They're interacting with the performers. And when the artists were talking about the work, they said, we feel like we have to teach children things in our artwork for them. But children just are also allowed to just have culture and just have art. And that the meaning can be made later. So when you talk about the meditation of it, the experience of it, and you come out and not knowing, like I read those Pearl S. Buck books and I went in, I went deep in, and I reflect over time about what that means and what the cultural context is. Um, because sometimes I feel like we give, we put too much on the shoulders of the artists to sort all that stuff out prior to just making the thing and seeing how it rests <coughs> with the other things on the shelf. And I, I think in life also it's not about uh, only understanding, you know. You have so many uh, different um, emotions and, and, uh, and some aspects that come to you that, um, like, Imitating uh, some somehow life is is, is is the magic for me too, and uh, and not that uh, um, approach with analysis. Yeah. Yes, and um, <laughs> yeah, I agree. Oh, okay. I mean, go one, two. So um, the idea of the overwhelming persuasiveness. Mm -hmm in my mind is a little bit moderated, at least in the form of the technology I've experienced, like a commercial arcade with kids, you know, um, in that you're in this world, you know, in your brain visually, but you've got this heavy thing on your head and you're tethered by a wire, you can only move so much, you're aware of your little feet shuffling, so you have, I have like this double consciousness of like zooming around in this world where I like shot things with paint guns or whatever, and having this enclosed sort of 
weird constrained space. So I was very aware that I was in this VR world created by this thing because of the other cues my body were giving me. And it, it is actually, to my mind, a little bit more present, maybe because it's also very new, but um, you know, when you sit in a theater and the lights go down, the performer starts, you really lose your body for the most part. You just forget you're sitting in a chair in the space. You're, you're projecting <coughs> your head forward. So I don't know that that propagandistic thing is, you know, can necessarily be that overwhelming because you're aware of your own positionality. Right. Because the, right now the present, that form of the, the technology. It, there's a somatic feedback that is always saying, um, mm. this is your anchor. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with the body in the works? Like, how do you deal with that somatic uh, input, the body input? Uh, it is um, very difficult to create um, mm, immersive 360 video experience because of the body. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. So we made so many uh, videos and uh, without the body. And you look down and there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. It's very weird. If you place the camera too low, then you mm -hmm. feel like a child. It's also not, uh, not the best. Um, there was this documentary um, by Felix and Paul about a famous bas basketball player, um, Lebron James. Uh, and he was huge there, you know, and it was really working because um, maybe in reality it's 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 the same. Uh, so this perspective is um, is important when it comes to video, but when it comes to um, six degrees of freedom experiences, um, on one hand, hands are enough, mm. and I think. Um, if you can see your hands and your fingers, mm -hmm. that is really um, enough on one hand. Uh, in 360 video, after many cases, we found out that if we can't have a first person perspective, the camera on the helmet uh, kind of um, shot, then a, a piece of black. Um, gradient uh, mask underneath you is the best. I mean, people associate black as nothing, yeah. and that's why it works the best. So they're in, the perception is being kind of in a donut, <laughs> like the donut hole. Maybe. Yeah. That's a very Canadian thing to yeah. say. <laughs> the international sign of the donut. <laughs> Uh, but also it depends on the on the experience. I would like to tell you about uh, a few experiences I found uh, in um, art galleries uh, because uh, the art world is taking VR medium and I'm very happy about it. Mm. I've seen last year at, in uh, Guggenheim in New York a piece um, where the user is a basketball. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and it was... Um, very immersive uh, because um, you were being played by a Chinese NBA player. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was all, um, all um, um, an exhibition by a Chinese artist. Uh, so first he was coming to you, you were a small ball, you know, and this uh, basketball player was uh, huge and then he catches you and then mm, goes and, and slams uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, and then you come back. It's like uh, forty seconds maximum, but the nausea effect is massive. You know, <laughs> you almost can 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 f fell off the chair. Uh, but it was good uh, somehow, and the context was about uh, his uh, the player's um, rage or uh, maybe not rage, but uh, um, his point of view. He's always a little bit controversial when it comes to um, what's going on in China. Um, um, but um, the most hardcore um, VR piece I know is by Jordan Wolfson, Real Violence. It was presented at Whitney Biennial in New York in March 2017. Did you say the name of the Georgian? Jordan? Jordan. Okay. Wolfson. 
And it was 90 seconds, uh, sh like shot of a figure viciously beating another person, kneeling in front of them uh, with a baseball bat. And there was no context, no story, no reason whatsoever. And uh, you know, art world is uh, can be this this very disruptive. And um, I like that uh, idea not to create only beautiful and. Uh, um, and um, let's say uh, quiet pieces, but uh, this kind of context, uh, this kind of uh, VR is also um, interesting. Most of the people didn't watch it till the end, mm. and uh, what's the point? You know, just to show it, you know, because so many people still don't understand that uh, mm, that violence is uh, just not acceptable. Uh, and uh, this was just a mm, very first uh, mm, approach to VR, I think. At first, everybody thought that it's about empathy. empathy. Uh, but now I think it's more about watching your hands, watching your body, being inside of, of uh, the character. And talking about the body, we made one piece, a uh, multiplayer uh, experience called mm, Body Extension Open Source. And uh, I could show it to you on Saturday. Mm. And you have the full body in HTC Vive, so the quality is quite uh, good. You are morphing. You don't know whether you are a man or a woman. Um, and, um, and it's a multiplayer piece. Mm. So you can interact with mm. as many people as we have uh, headset. And, and uh, we, it was really interesting to watch people how they act in this piece um, and some groups of friends were dancing together some were uh, uh, touching their hands because you could touch in the real world and mm -hmm. in, in VR too mm -hmm. but uh, we didn't have um, um, enough uh, time and uh, uh, technology to track exactly uh, the people's uh, place so um, actually, you're not touching, uh, if you're coming in VR world to somebody, you're not touching the person in reality. <coughs> so you can even go inside somebody else. You mm. know? And it was a mistake from our uh, side, but it occurred, uh, the mistake was working. The same, uh, um, similar situation with, um, with AR. Uh, we used AR Core, which doesn't have at this moment um, image tracking. So when you place this augmented reality animation on, on the book and you take out the book, the animation doesn't follow the book. Kind it's not tracked with the book. It, just it will stay here. Yeah. But then, because of this, we can put the, the, the uh, augmented reality anywhere mm. uh, and leave it there and shoot it, for example, and, and see it. So it's also interesting to know about the fact that uh, from some mistakes and technical boundaries, you can make a value. But coming back to the body, um, the, it's, it's really very interesting to, um, to have a body in VR and to, um, to have the ability to touch uh, other um, virtual bodies uh, there. Mm -hmm. uh, because um, our, um, our VR experience was about pleasure, was about uh, um, asking Mm, yourself about um, how do you how how you react and uh, interact with uh, with others. Mm -hmm. uh, I was not shy, in, in, so I was just uh, you know touching and interacting e everybody. But then I found out I can be a little bit uh, like um, not violent but uh, abusive maybe in mm -hmm. in this VR. But then I thought about it, you know. So this is a big responsibility and ethic matter. Uh, what can we show and, uh, and how we act in this world, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, so we should probably think about it uh, um, more. <laughs> and, uh, and another piece that I found very, very interesting uh, was during uh, Venice Biennale in 2017. Um, it was um, mm, Christian Lamert's uh, mm, 
la apparazione. It's like a virtual meeting with uh, crucified Jesus. Mm. And it's a three minute uh, piece. Uh, the Jesus, Jesus is golden and from his wounds uh, is um, leaking uh, liquid gold mm. and, uh, and he's dying. Uh, and really um, you can hear his wounds breaking as if he was wooden a, a, a little bit. You can see uh, his body so closely because you can walk around and um, and it was really very powerful for me to see it, mm. and um, and just to be in the dream of of the artist. And the the last thing that I want to say uh, now about uh, experiences uh, was um, that uh, the example of uh, Paul McCarthy's uh, um, work. Uh, he made this piece, What is Your Name, Mary and Eve, experiment. And um, it was like a continuation of his work. So I like the fact that uh, Olafur Eliasson or uh, um, Marina Abramovic or other artists extend their previous works and uh, come into VR. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Paul McCarthy's, uh, it was on one hand, the production wise, it was interesting because the uh, Actors were shot in LA in a studio, motion capture, and then brought to Denmark, Copenhagen, and Cora Contemporary Gallery uh, finished the work in VR. Yeah. Uh, so the artists uh, mm, didn't have to even move, you know, from his studio. Mm -hmm. um, and it was about the position of, of women, and he used. Uh, um, two characters from a western movie with John Wayne. It was um, mm, uh, like a wild, wild west, uh, uh, yeah. you know, always the, the women were in s a strange situation and their position was uh, so much weaker. And uh, here in this piece, uh, there are two women who are very aggressive towards you, yeah. and there are many of them coming to you, swearing at you. Yeah. And after ten minutes, I was very, very tired. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I like it. I like it when it's uh, when it's glitchy, when it's something you know, not uh, makes you think, makes you think, uh, feel uncomfortable. Uh, so these kind of um, experiences are uh, important for me and interesting. I wonder if there's, yeah, Amy in the back. I just had a question about, uh, have you ever heard in your work about, like, you kind of touched on it with the body, the experience of going into a VR moment is kind of jarring, because we don't have our body and for other reasons as well. And the experience of coming out of it, if you've had an intense experience in one, can also be kind of jarring. You take it off and all of a sudden you're back in this room with other people and the, um, the jump between the two is, is really extreme sometimes. Do you ever think about the transition into that moment <coughs> transition out as part of your work? Uh, I've seen, yes, we're doing such experiments. Um, for example, one of our uh, VR experiences uh, has uh, seven chapters. Each chapter is a little bit different. In one chapter, you have a body, a scanned actor. In another cha chapter, you are just a camera and you don't have it. And. Um, for some of the viewers, we asked, it was quite um, disturbing uh, because uh, it was like, okay, you have the power to move, you have your body, but then we take it from you. Yeah. Uh, and so we were cruel as, as, as uh, creators, but um, it's still an experiment. So uh, we are finding the way uh, and um, and we would like to stay experimental and uh, fresh. Um, so, uh, so there is one example when a character is dying, and even in 360 uh, degrees video, and uh, I saw this film when everything is from first person perspective uh, view, camera on the helmet, and then at the moment of the incident in a car crash, 
then the camera moves on a crane and then on a drone up. And mm, maybe it's simple, but it works. So for me, when it comes to editing in VR, and when it comes to these transitions that you told about, it's all about the concept. If it goes well with the script, with the concept, it will be good. But just changing from one to another without any reason is pointless. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 like, I understand where you're coming from. I, I mean also like even kind of more zoomed out, the idea of, of um, putting on the, the, the headpiece. You know, I saw one piece where you go in and you sit in a curtained room, and it's a, a very stylized room, and then you put on the headset, and inside the headset you're still in that room. And I felt that that was such an effective transition <laughs> into that world, um, because it kept, like it really blurred the boundaries between the two worlds, and they, they kind of negotiated that really beautifully. Just wondering if you're thinking about that that transition like into the headset and the world inside the headset versus the world around you and, and staging that at all yes it's very important and um, uh, and this um, carne y arena by alejandro inaritu was uh, probably um, uh, one of the first pieces where you walk on the desert and in reality you take off your shoes and walk on sand uh, the same uh, I, I've seen in Prague uh, recently uh, on a bigger exhibition, uh, mm, 36Q, uh, mm, by a um, mm, Dutch uh, university and collaboration of many countries. Uh, so the more um, mm, objects and props you have that you can uh, actually touch in real time and in VR, VR using, pro for example, VR trackers, mm, like uh, HTC trackers, uh, the better. And the uh, more, um, mm, it's, it's really uh, um, very interesting and, and very powerful when you have uh, the same construction, the same set design in virtual and real world. Uh, so limiting the area that you walk on is uh, one approach to this. Uh, then some constructions, for example, I recently uh, mm, came up with an idea to um, make a metal construction that you can hang on. Mm -hmm. And you know, you have the same in VR, and you hang, then you can have a Grand Canyon, um, or um, I don't know, <laughs> just, uh, uh, just to work on your <laughs> you know, fears. <laughs> um, but, um, but seriously, um, yes, it's a very good way. Um, for example, that you have a torch or an object that you can grab, that uh, some of the characters are represented as sculptures. I've seen it at The Void, uh, the Star Wars experience that you can watch in States and UK, I suppose. Um, so I was talking to the former C-3PO, I don't remember the name, <laughs> and then uh, I reached with a hand and there was the sculpture there. It was very simple, just a metal face of, of the robot, but he was there. Mm -hmm. uh, then all the, mm, mm, you know, heat or uh, some air or some smoke coming uh, in, bo in both realities is very powerful and uh, it gets the immersion, the feeling of presence, because we want to achieve this presence, right? And uh, like um, I was um, mentioning before, we need to have very good environment, uh, sometimes similar to the real one. We need to have the body, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and each of these aspects, we must think about it very, very uh, precisely and talk with others about it. Okay, we have to have the environment, but, but what environment? Yeah, what is around us? Why, uh, etc. Okay, body, but what body? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, etc. etc. Um, so the body, then communication with others is is also great. So when you have an actor and an avatar um, that you can speak to, um, and they are connected somehow technologically, this is great. This is really fantastic because you know when you want uh, communicate with other people. It's, uh, it's a great feeling, yeah? And the same when you're in VR. You're looking for somebody to talk to. You want to share something. You want to um, uh, live with, uh, uh, you know, experience something with others. Uh, 
So, mm, mm, so the body, the communication, then touching objects and moving them, and uh, and uh, and that the, these are the rules of uh, uh, of the presence and the very good quality. You know. I'm gonna have to um, leave it. I'm gonna leave it a bookmark in this conversation. And by all means, I invite you to continue the conversation as we're together over the next couple of days or, or online using hashtag Folda at Twitter and all those other places that are happening over here. But our group in this real life room is going to head onto a trolley to Gananoque um, to see the and hear about a VR experiment that's happening there that's part of the Thousand Islands Playhouse Innovation Residency uh, and we want to hear from Nick Bio and Gata Jane about what they've been working on. So I want to thank you so much Wojciech for uh, sharing so much and I'd ask, I know you were referring to, I have this vision over view over here that you were referring to an article and I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing a link to the article that you're referring to on our Slack channel. Yes, uh, it's, it's, it's quite old, it's two years old, um, so it's <laughs> like ancient in VR. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, okay. I would be happy to share it. Okay, thank you so much and, and thanks to all of you. Uh, we'll see you downstairs to hop on a trolley. There's some blankets in a basket, so if you want to grab a blanket. All right, thank you. Thank you.